is history, the future mystery. This moment is the gift. Every second we're we, It's Dr. Sarah Larson, and you are listening to Miracle Makers at UBN Radio. I am just so excited <laughs> about today's show. Childhood dreams keep coming true for me, and I get to share them with my very darling husband, who's in studio with us. Welcome, Greg Larson. <laughs> Welcome, Miracle Makers. I am so blessed to be here today. It's actually very funny. I feel so transformed. We just ended our four-week, 5 a.m. boot camp this morning. We graduated. We graduated. <laughs> we are now initiates of the Castaldi Boot Camp, and it was such an amazing experience. I was looking at pictures of me on that very first recording we did. I was New Year's Day, and I looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy. I was so plump <laughs> at that time. And, uh, and then luckily we did sign up for this boot camp, which we were both very much called to do. And now I feel a uh, lot stronger, more flexible, trimmed out a little bit, and... Uh, Definitely ready for this next leg of our journey. And we're on our date. <laughs> <laughs> we get to, we have such a fantastic, amazing life, two great children, and an entourage of people that are with us. So our time together ha happens to be shared with all of you guys. And recently, we just had the most exquisite experience. Mm. When I was a kid and I moved to the U.S., from um, from Asia, there were cowboy and Indian shows on television all the time. And my brother's sister and I would play cowboys and Indians, but we didn't play it the traditional way. We were always making peace between the cowboys and Indians, and we always wanted the peace pipe. <laughs> Whatever we could learn, and in the encyclopedias, because back when we moved to this country, there were there was no internet. We had the encyclopedias, and we got to learn about all of the different tribes and the different nations. And I always wished, like my childhood wish, was to really meet an Indian chief and really to have this experience of making peace between cowboys and Indians. And if you catch a glimpse of my husband he looks like a cowboy and <laughs> his sister and his family they ride horses and just the other day we got to meet one the hereditary chief he is the chief of the Ihanka want Tawan Dakota and Chickasaw Nation the great Sioux Nation the seven councils we've got Chief Phil Lane Jr. at UBN Studios here in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> the real American Canadian hereditary chief to this the Great Sioux Seven Council, these nations is here in studio with us. It literally is a dream come true to spend time with you, Chief. Well, thank you. Very, very honored, Sister Sarah, Dr. Sarah, and your beloved husband. I want to say I'm one of the uh, hereditary chiefs of the Great Sioux Nation uh, and the Chickasaw Nation because there's others as well who are serving in their communities who have held on to their traditional uh, leadership, which, by the way, uh, yeah, the U.S. government did everything it could to remove that mm. from our tribal uh, traditional ways and, in fact, change it around so that we were uh, assimilated into the system as much as possible. Mm. Um, I'm so grateful that the language, before we went on air, you spoke the language of the, the uh, um, Ihanka Tawan. Is that, am I saying that correctly? Well, actually, actually the Ihanka Tawan Dakota are yes. part uh, or one of the seven council fires of the Great Sioux Nation or the seven council fires. And there's actually uh, three dialects. There's Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota. 
really they can all be understood, but it's simply that the D's and the N's and the uh, L's are exchanged. So if you have a spiritual friend, a very rare spiritual brother, you would call him, if you were a Dakota, Koda. Koda. If you were a Lakota, you'd call him Kola. If you were a Nakota, you'd call him Kona. So the languages are, are, are able to be understood between, between each other. Uh, between each other. I, mm. I'm so grateful that this great tradition that was born of this land, indigenous to the area, continues on. And th- it's a miracle as mm. much of the world here that came to these lands and tried to conquer it, tried to wipe it out in various forms, in various ways, th- you and your nation and the, uh, the numerous chiefs, the language, the traditions being passed down is evidence of m- the miraculous. And mm. that's one of... and. In your tradition, in the lineage, today what we're going to talk about on the show is quite extraordinary miracles and the miraculous within your culture. I'm so excited and grateful that you're here and that you can share firsthand experiences of the oral tradition that's been passed down. Yes, yes. In fact, you know, before the coming of others to the Western Hemisphere, to the Americas, which I believe is all part of a greater plan. Mm. Even the last 500 years in which prior to the coming of others to this beautiful uh, Turtle Island to the Americas, um, there was already a union of the Condor, Quetzal, and Eagle. And these old, old prophecies more than 500 years ago, foretold that this great spiritual wintertime was coming where the world would leave the understanding or the connection to Mother Earth and the understanding that we're spiritual beings as well as physical beings and we're only here for a very short time, and that our purpose here is to learn to know and to love the Creator by gaining and growing our spiritual qualities versus acquiring material things. But that for a period of 500 years, there would be this great spiritual wintertime. It's amazing to have, there's some water for you right next to you as well. It's amazing for me to have this experience because indigenous to this land, we get to stand on your shoulders and what was created, those that were here in 500 years Prior to it, um, the white man, the others coming, there were prophecies of their coming. There are prophecies of the unification. When you speak of the condor, these um, uh, the southern council, everything is symbolic. Everything yes. means something. Every animal, every energy has a spirit behind it yes and this is so important to the philosophy that every material thing has a spirit as well as every um spirit can come into a material form absolutely absolutely in fact prior to the coming of other relatives of the human family here the four sacred colors that you can find on temples, Mayan temples, that you can find in different tribal nations in South America, in Mexico, here in the Turtle Island, as we call it, are red, yellow, black, and white. Symbolically, no, symbolically, because we're not literally, physically, every one of us, these four colors, because we're blends also. But the red representing the indigenous people of the Americas, who, by the way, um, have a very deep connection or have a gift of the earth. And so you see all our earth-based traditions. And then to the south, where we're the sun at high noon, is kind of like yellow. Yes. Not, not that the people are yellow, but it's referring to those people of uh, China and India and Southeast Asia and all through that area 
but they have a gift too. That gift is the wind, the air. And you find in all their traditions, they have the wind, the meditation, that breath of life. Mm. <laughs> and then you have to the west from where comes the sun goes down, the color black, meaning are all our relatives of Africa. And those relatives have a gift of the water. And that water, you know, you see there's the longest river in the world is in, yes. in the in Nile. Nile River. Yeah. And many other gifts of the water that are yet to come. Mm. And then you have the north from where comes the white snow. Symbolically, the uh, European nations or tribes, but they have a gift, the gift of fire. And everything that has brought about this time of incredible technology, everything that the European uh, relatives have at the center of their technology is fire. Yes. <laughs> whether it be electricity, whether it be weapons, whether it be uh, all what we're speaking out here through the Internet, it's a, in a way a form of this fire. Mm. But it's also prophesied uh, when we were all gathered beneath the sacred tree of life so, so far back, they say, if you could just close your eyes and remember we were all came from the same place. Like Muhammad says, one of the things I've read all the different sacred books and to, to see and, and to realize that really all these sacred teachings spiritually are one. Mm -hmm. Now, how they're, how they're actually applied and how people may reflect them is different. But Muhammad said, we all come from the same clot of blood. Mm. We all come from the same clot, clot of blood. Yeah. And you talk about that in your book, yes. uh, um, the, uh, how we come from the same, uh, the same root, the same seed, uh, and the yes. sacred tree of life. Yes. It's such a fantastic... Uh, um, and the colors and the symbolism and the four directions are all mentioned here. And as we were talking, you mentioned that there this transcends location it's in south america the peoples of north america the peoples all over the world one of the things that i learned um is our ancient altars all had the same components yes and the same stones and the same symbols yes. whether they were in india or yes. china or in Northern Europe, in yes. um, uh, Estonia, here in South America or North America, yes. all of them had the same components. Yes. All the peoples, even though we don't know how they could have communicated, had the same way in which they built altars, performed ceremonies, connected with the earth and with the spirits. The um, a bird and its symbolism, the feather and its symbolism, he, here or in China or in Europe, and each of the tribes had a similar, if not the same, meaning. Absolutely, and since we all at one time were truly educated by our Mother Earth, and we all sat before the sacred fire, it's interesting to note that. Uh, the two most universal archetype symbols of all peoples are a sacred tree and a circle. A sacred tree and a circle. And you can find them everywhere on Mother Earth. Because really, it's not really surprising in a way that all of us at one time in our history, before we became disconnected from our Mother Earth because of technology because of uh, our, our greed for money or the material world that became so alluring to our senses that we forgot our mother, that all of us were educated by the natural laws that govern our mother earth. Therefore, it's not, a, it's, it's not really a surprise that we all share these karma, common archetypes. I think that Carl Jung really does this beautifully. My uncle Vine Deloria Jr. is the only uh, native author who actually read the Red Book of Carl Jung four times, he read all <laughs> his extensive writings, and he finally took him four books. But before the end of the li his life, he um, uh, published a book called 
Sioux traditions in in C. G. Jung, oh, and wow. felt that his work, in fact, states it of any of the European thinkers who uh, come closest to bridging um, the indigenous worldview, the indigenous cosmovision. And I'm I'm saying, by the way, that's that's uh, there's a unity and diversity, but the basics yes. of this is Carl Jung. Carl Jung was the um, mm. psychologist that mm-hmm. studied, and Carl, uh, he came up with that collective consciousness yes. and how the collective consciousness, um, and today science can prove a, a flapping wing in Japan can cause a hurricane in North America. We can also now prove prove, um, not just theorize, that a thought can be had by multiple people at the same time. Uh, um, This collective consciousness can be tapped and shared. Yes. And then Carl Jung inspired other thinkers who were the ones that then inspired films like Star Wars. Yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, others. May the force be with you. May the force be with that you. Carl, that energy. Um, I want to bring you in on this conversation yeah. as well. What comes up for you as we're talking? Uh, well, what I, I'm experiencing is just a depth, which I so appreciate. You know, because this show is called Miracle Makers, and we're exploring how to create miracles, how to receive miracles in your life. And to me, it seems like... Um, you know, native people who are more connected to the earth would have been in a greater witness to the miracle of life, would have been in, in greater capacity to receive miracles, to believe in miracles. And I think that the more you are immersed into a, like a, I want to say like a static society, you lose touch with that. Mm-hmm. And so that's, uh, but I'm feeling the depth of it. And I'm feeling the miraculous from you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, really, uh, we are the miracle. Yeah, and I remember a grandmother of mine when I began my journey back in 1968. I, after that, I began attending various of our indigenous ceremonies, the Sun Dance and our Nika Ka, the Sweat Lodge, and uh, went to the Coast Salish and got a chance to experience their smokehouse dances, which are so so powerful, mm. and the Chinook dance up among the Okanagan people, and many many different ceremonies in many parts of the world, yeah. and of course. Uh, I went to one of my grandmothers, and and she was aware of this, and she also was aware I really needed to get grounded Mm. (laughs) (laughs) and not get carried away. So she asked me, she said, Oh, Takosha, she said, Grandson, I hear you've been going to all these different ceremonies. And I kind of very proudly began to tell her all these ceremonies I'd gone to, and she asked me this question. She said, said, Takosha, what is the most sacred ceremony of all ceremonies? Of course, that was quite a profound <laughs> question. <laughs> what is the most sacred ceremony of all the ceremonies? And so I mentioned different ceremonies that I thought were the most sacred. Of course, they were all sacred. Yeah. And then she looked me deep in the eye. She said, you know, she said, grandson, the most sacred ceremonies of all ceremonies is the birth of a child. <laughs> wow. Then she looked me deep in my eyes and she said, then who are you? <laughs> <laughs> then who are you? Mm. We are sacred beings. Yeah. We are sacred beings. Each of us is a sovereignty, ancient, imperishable, and everlasting. Mm. And, of course, uh, I asked um, one of my elders one time, one of my grandfathers, I said, how do we know we have a soul? How do we know we have a soul? How do we know we have this part of us that is beyond time and space, this part of us that's eternal, Mm. this part of us that uh, goes beyond this physical world and transcends this physical experience? And he says, you know, Taco Shaw, there's many ways that we can find and understand we have a soul. You know, there's that time when the the veil between this world and the other worlds becomes very thin, and we can see relatives and we experience relatives who have gone on. Just like the baby in the mother's womb is only separated from this world in a very, very small womb world, so to speak, yeah. womb wall. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes. And yet all around that child in the womb, all kinds of worlds are unfolding. Mm. But he says, you'll notice, he said, they've been studying now uh, uh, the mind. And, uh, and I followed that up and, you know, they have been in all these sleep clinics. And they know that when we're awake, they can measure our brain waves. If we get excited about things and we yes. see new things and so forth, these brain waves change. But when it comes time for us to sleep, we truly, in terms of our, our senses, die from the world. Hmm. Our eyes close. Our ears stop hearing what's going on outside. Even our sense of smell turns off. Of course, why many people burn up in fires, even though the smoke is very heavy, but they can't smell the smoke. Oh. You know, our sense of taste you know, our vision, it all begins to go to sleep. And as it does, the brain waves go lower and lower and lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. And lower. You'd think they finally just turn off. Instead, when they get to the very bottom, when it seems like they're completely stopped, they become more active mm. than when we're awake. Mm. Of course, this is what scientists call yes. a paradox. Anything that science can't understand, they call it a paradox. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this old gentleman said, he said, you know, Taco Shaw, he said, one of the ways that we can understand we have a soul is through our dreams. Mm -hmm. He said, not every dream. He said, sometimes you eat too much pizza or you eat too much. <laughs> <laughs> he said, and you're just going through a process of, 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 of uh, integrating the day's experiencing experiences uh, into your soul. Mm. But he said, there are those times early in the morning when you get these very bright colored dreams, with p bright colors. In fact, they're so intense, we wake up and they have a profound impact on our lives. Mm. And he said, even though our senses are completely asleep, we see things without eyes. Mm. We hear things without ears. We travel places without legs. We speak to each other without words. Mm. We hear things without ears. I know many have, have gone to sleep uh, in our traditions and have woken up and been given a new song. Mm. Yes. Or, or a problem they couldn't solve the day before. We couldn't solve the day before. We wake up the next morning, it's clear to us. Yeah. It's been resolved. And then sometimes we dream things tonight that happen tomorrow or even 10 years from now. Yeah. In our gathering we had at your beautiful home, I remember somebody was saying, I was standing on the other side of the room and all of a sudden they said, you know, I saw all of this Yes. more than 10 years ago. Everything, every detail of this, it's just coming to me. So the soul has that capacity to transcend time and space. That is truly a miracle, and the soul is something we're just, you know, just beginning to understand. I think that's why Albert Einstein says, when science is able to understand the power of prayer, science will advance more than it's ever advanced in the past. Mm. Oh, it's such a beautiful statement. And um, Michael, our, our, our guest in our home, was saying, I had dreamt every aspect of this night more than 10 years ago. And you're sharing, we know we have a soul because although our body is in a semi-paralyzed state when we're sleeping, every aspect of us is available beyond it can move travel through time space mm. travel through any limitation in our sleep state and we have these profound moving experiences mm -hmm. these moving experiences become visions of the future sometimes they become um, clues for what happened in the past they are um, basically connecting us with aspects of our forgotten self in some ways. And science is now 
learning about that. We were talking so much that doctors are the new priest. Mm -hmm. Now, what a doctor tells you, what a medicine person Mm -hmm. tells you, we tend to believe. What scientists are studying, what we believe in science is now studying the soul. IONS Institute studied Mm -hmm. doctors praying for their patients, uh, um, prayers being said for patients without the patients even knowing those patients got better. Yes. The power of prayer, the power of intention, the power of community gathering for a purpose. Yes. This was seen in the Eagle Condor prophecy. Elders sat together and sat and caught uh, in a very still state the visions of the soul And the Condor Eagle prophecy is now coming to pass. Can you tell us about this prophecy that was seen 500 years ago and it's now coming? Sure. Well, more than 500 years ago, there was over 100 million indigenous people living across the Americas. 100 million. 100 million. There's a great book called 1491 that was one of the first books that began to go back and do the research that demonstrates there was a hundred million indigenous people here prior to others coming. So miracle makers, I want you to hear this. It is possible to support a hundred million people here on this earth, on this land, in this part of the world. We're never going to run out of resources if we respect the earth. Exactly. Mm. um, And as you're sharing, please go ahead. Yes, and so these these hundred million relatives across all of the Americas, North, Central, and South America, uh, were all united in this union of the Condor, representing the people of the South, the Quetzal, representing the people of Central America, and the Eagle, representing the people of the North. And um, they were continually, we were continually trading, trading back and forth. And we called these trails that now all the major highways and byways of the Americas are built on former trade routes of indigenous people. We call them kinship trails. Kinship trails. Kinship (laughs) trails because we made relatives. Yes. So when I've been to Guatemala to their great temple there in Guatemala City, they were able to tell me stories of my ancestors who came there to Guatemala City, where it's now Guatemala City. Yes. You know, we had stories of the place of the seven sacred lakes. And yesterday we had a great bounty of meeting with uh, uh, several hundred wonderful, beautiful uh, students from Mexico, primarily from other places in Central and South America. And I asked him, what is the place we called the sacred place of the seven sacred lakes. The seven sacred lakes, of course, was Mexico City. Yes. Mm. Mexico City. In Caracas, Venezuela, was also much like that. I've been up on the, if you go into Caracas, up uh, uh, there's some high, high, high uh, uh, mountains almost, but kind of a plateau way above uh, Caracas. And there's ruins up there of indigenous people. But at the time when the uh, Spanish arrived, Caracas was a great lake. And the word Caracas means eagle. Oh, wow. And the eagle was, in fact, what the lake that was below this this, this, um, uh, high, high, high flat kind of, I don't know what to call it. Uh, ridge like, like, a, like, a mesas, like, a, yeah. mesas. like a mesa yeah, yeah. Like, very like a mesa you could see this eagle uh, this lake in the shape of an eagle and so there were sacred places all through wow. the americas you know of course uh, my cousin orville looking horse chief orville looking horse keeper of the 19th uh, white buffalo calf pipe he is he and his wonder, wonderful wife paula are really doing what they can to help us restore these sacred places. And it's very sad 
that in many places in Guatemala, in Mexico, and other places, indigenous people are not allowed to use their sacred sites. They're not allowed to use them the as they have in the past. The government hasn't yet seen the it purpose. Hasn't, it, yeah. The time hasn't come, but it will come. Yes. These, these sacred sites are coming together. It's, Mother Earth is alive. Mm. <laughs> Mother Earth is alive. And the sacred uh, spaces were built on places that really are alive amplifiers of yes. these pr places, like our throat on our body yes. is an amplification and uses all of our resources, but we can hear it. Um, our heart is another place we can hear and yes. feel. Our pulses are other places. And these sacred sites are built on the pulse points, the, the vocal points, the seeing points of earth, That's right. much like our bodies. And right. so... Uh, um, the acupuncture this, points. The acupuncture, oh, yeah. <laughs> the meridian, the ley lines. Yes. And we can see when you measure those areas, something... That they go off the scale with what's what's measured right by them, and governments have been afraid in the past of letting ceremonies be held there because they weren't understood by the religion or by the group completely. But as we become more able to speak our own language and interact with each other's traditions and languages and see, oh, it's just off a letter or a sound here. This, oh, this is another way to say this in each of the languages. The more we recognize how alike and uh, highlight the diversity, the uniqueness at the same time, the more the governments and each of the people that stand behind mm -hmm. the governments are able to recognize how important this time period is. Um, as we're speaking, I, I do want you to talk about what you saw in Paris. You were coming back from the environmental, uh, uh, the need we have right now to be the communicators for the miraculous happening on the earth. It's happening, but the more of us become aware of what's needed, the more rapidly with which we can be in the miraculous to receive it. Yes. Before sharing that, I want to share that, uh, that uh, um, if I quiet myself and think about the experiences I've had over the last 48 years in which I've been on this conscious spiritual journey, on one hand, I can hear the death cries of the old dying away, and we can see it happening all around us. Uh, yes. And along with it, uh, we can see the destruction of Mother Earth increasing. On the other hand, I hear the death, uh, the birth cries, the, the birth pangs of a new rising. And our prophecies talked about this, and I think it was so wonderful to be with these young people who are a manifestation of the prophecy of the seventh generation of this young generation that's arising that uh, in these over 7 billion human beings on the Mother Earth, 50% of them are under 25 years old. 50% 50% are coming up are 25 years, years, old. years old. More amazing is right here in this uh, land we live in, in the Americas, into the north, to the Inuit, to the Eskimo, their average age is 19 in the United States and Canada, the average age of the Native American or First Nations or indigenous people of Canada the United States is 25, the mm -hmm. average age. We go south to Mexico, the average age across Mexico is 25. Wow. 25. And south of Mexico, the average age in many countries is 19 years old. You see, when you see that coming up, it's going to... Uh, create this incredible change. So I had the opportunity to be involved in the environmental movement, uh, clear back to uh, the Earth Summit in Rio Plus 20, and then I went to COP21. And it was amazing to me, because I really believe we've gone over the edge in many ways environmentally. Uh, and the 
challenges we're going to have and the uh, suffering we're going to go through in the process of awakening will go on and deepen until we awaken to the fact that Mother Earth is alive. But um, in going there, it was, it was amazing to me to see that all these nation states came together. Uh, they were all asked to make their own pledges. So they, they, they realized they couldn't get everybody to agree, so they said, well, you can all make your own pledges of how, many, how much carbon uh, you're going to uh, 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 cut back. And of all the nation states in the world, only one nation state out of all the nation states actually made a commitment to cut back their carbon emissions, and that was Bolivia. Woohoo, Bolivia! A country of 90 <laughs> million indigenous people, which I had the opportunity to go and spend two years in 1970 and 71, where I was really understood much more deeply the reunion of the Condor and the Eagle and the Quetzal because elders that with with me and mentored me were young men like myself at the time and their elders mentored them and mentored them and mentored them and mentored them all the way back to more than 500 years ago so this has very been very much alive in my being uh, this whole this whole prophecy but what I found in Paris was this that if okay, what did it accomplish? Really, stopping climate change? No. Uh, are we going to have deeper and deeper challenges because of change, climate change? Yes. But at least for the first time, all the nation states agreed there was something called climate change. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Which awareness is the greatest agent of change. So yes, yeah. there's awareness. Yeah. Yes. But um, um, what they did, other than Bolivia, uh, was kind of, a, in a way, a trick. It's because the way it sounds, they're cutting back. But what they're saying is all these nation states in the world, especially the major nation states like China and the United States and Canada and Europe and so forth, is they expect, and because they're so caught up in this model of consumption, yeah. they're going to continue to produce and consume as much as they can as they have in the past. It's just the amount of pollution that they've caused in the past for doing this, they're gonna cut that down. Mm. So when you hear mm. reducing 2% uh, carbon emissions, it's not 2% from where we're at today. It's saying that as they move forward, they're going to reduce carbon emissions from what they continue to do from what they did in the past, which means c carbon emissions will continue to right. increase. Wow. Um, uh, and the Condor Eagle prophecy prophesizes a thousand years of peace coming and a time absolutely. of greatness on Earth. Absolutely. Th where the Earth is alive, the Garden of Eden alive. Absolutely. And um, so even though these nations are not pledging at these levels, we've got young people. We've got a plethora of beautiful, amazing young men, people listening to this show that are hearing the needs and the cries and the prophecies and are able to fulfill, to become the miracle maker of those prophecies. Can you tell us just about the Eagle um, Condor prophecy and lay out for us some of the things that those listening can help in facilitating? Well, one thing we must remember that we're all indigenous members of the human family and our mother is Mother Earth. That every one of us on this Mother Earth, first teacher was Mother Earth. We all sat before the sacred fire. Yes. We all were nurtured and educated by the natural world. And that it's important for us to go back wherever we can and regain that connection to our Mother Earth and to understand what the real meaning of sacredness is. And I would say that to me, uh, I see a 
unity of science and spirituality, an essential unis- unity of true spirituality and true, true religion. And I'm talking about the religion as a word that means to bind together, to bring unity, to bring uh, compassion. I call what I see in the name of religion today, churchianity. <laughs> I can't really give it the name Christianity or other names of other spiritual traditions because that purpose was to come together and bind together. Now, religion or spirituality without science, without reason, can become fanaticism. And I see this in the world today, fanaticism. And I think what you mean is when it's not open to other information exactly. coming in. Exactly. Yes. And, and science, science without spirituality can become a Frankenstein. Yes. I mean, science without values can take this incredible gift we've been given by the Creator and be used in ways that aren't uh, life-preserving and life-enhancing. One of the things I think that really helped me understand this world we live in, in 1982, when Four Worlds was born, uh, we called a meeting of elders from across the United States and Canada to come to Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada, in the province of Alberta, uh, at the University of Lethbridge, for a very historic council. I don't believe it was ever ever done before. And so 40 incredible elders came together for four days and four nights. And we had asked them, because we were at the depth, the very depth of darkness uh, of the soul, we asked them, what can we do to come out of this, to eliminate alcoholism, to, to rebuild our families? And after we listened very, very closely and distilled what all those different elders had to say. They all spoke different languages. They came from different parts of Turtle Island. Uh, They had different traditions, different traditions of how they dressed. But in essence, what they said was the same. They said this universe we live in is organized according to certain natural laws. These physical and spiritual laws are inseparably connected. The physical laws are easy to understand. You jump off a 10-story building on your head, you'll get a headache. (laughs) You drink a glass of arsenic, you'll get a stomach ache. You drive a car 100 miles an hour into a concrete wall, and you're going to get smashed up. These are natural, physical laws. But then you have the spiritual laws, or guiding principles of which we have been working on since 1982 and brought to the United Nations in 1995, the 16 principles for building a sustainable, harmonious world. Things like development comes from within. Others can help and assist, but it must emerge from the individual, the family, the community. Mm -hmm. Uh, No vision, no development. No unity, no development. Another word for vision and unity would be the soul. Absolutely. Um, When you're connected to your soul, when you're connected, it's not being cut like a flower and placed into a vase. It's connected to the root and able to grow and blossom. Absolutely. And true sacredness, true spirituality, whether it's in science or in religion, is connected to the root system and is able to be watered and nourished and expands and grows. Yes, yes. And I think that's what's being asked for and called for. What are some of the steps that uh, um, we can take to, I know the reduce, refuse, recycle, that's one aspect of it. But others, such as gathering in community. Yes, yes. I th- and, and, and there's things that aren't being talked about that really have to be addressed if we're going to reduce climate change. One is the increasing militarism that's happening in the world. Yes. I mean, when you see uh, how... Um, and, and there's so many good things you can find about our, our uh, land we're standing in now, the United States of America... But it is the world's largest su- su- supplier of, of weapons, yeah. weapons of destruction. And so it's very, very, uh, um, I don't know, 
very uh, challenging when on one hand we are supplying the world with more weapons than any other nation state. There's other nation states certainly involved in this. On the other hand, we're talking about how much we want to bring about world peace. You can't have one without the other. And by the way, the greatest contributor to climate change is increasing militarism. The military is causing more damage and destruction to the environment than anything else. So anything you can do to really uh, realize we don't have to uh, bring about change only through using weapons to kill other human beings. We have to go beyond that adolescent stage of our spiritual development. I think another thing is the importance of understanding the spiritual reality of the equality of men and women. Mm. That until women are given the right to care for their own body, until women are given uh, equal rights, an equal voice, and an equal input into all the decision-making that's going on about today and the future, this is not going to happen. That's why in the Dakota teachings they say that the eagle has two wings. One is man and one is woman. Until both wings of that eagle have equal power and respect, the eagle of humanity will never yeah. rise as highest into uh, the future has been destined to go. So uh, one of the things you can do is really honor the feminine, the Absolutely. feminine flying um, equal to being used uh, uh, as much as spoken word leading as much as the masculine leading. When women are of equal status, not just here in North America, not just South America, but throughout the world, the peace will come back to yeah, the land. That's right. And until that happens, it will not come back to the land. But, you know, peace is not just possible. Peace is inevitable. The most great peace is unfolding. A new world global civilization is now unfolding based in the spiritual reality of the oneness of the human family. And with comes the understanding of the oneness of the human family comes the understanding that the herd of one is the herd of all. And the elimination of all forms of prophecy, uh, prejudice all forms of prejudice, anything that makes us think that we're better than or less than any other human being. If, uh, it's so beautiful. If you're judging someone, you can't be loving them. If you're judging, you're keeping the two wings from flying in equal harmony. If you're judging a woman, judging a man, judging any, even government at this point, without loving them, and creating pathways. One of the things that, as a kid, watching um, and visualizing, catching visions of cowboys and Indians at peace, uh, your headdress is fantastic. You're wearing this beautiful, and for anyone who's listening, listening rather than seeing this, you've got to see uh, um, Chief Phil Lane Jr. on screen, just an yeah. amazing, beautiful soul beautiful uh, um, headdress, what comes in is it's it, this government, peoples that are in leadership have developed all of these ways of seeing the world and have shared the way that they see the world with us. And in your book and in your teachings, we recognize that we don't each see the world um, as anyone else. Mm -hmm. In other words, we each see the world as we see it. And for us to begin looking through the lens of love and making possibility happen mm -hmm. for our governments, for those in leadership, for ourselves to really let, not judge them for the past, but love them for what's possible in yes, the future absolutely. and generate processes that will bring peace from us coming into the room without judgment, us coming in mm -hmm. with forgiveness, us looking at everyone mm -hmm. as equal 
to each other ourselves. So for me, that would mean not cowering in front of someone because they've got a title coming from the inside, giving myself enough permission to speak and holding that vision and that energy. Yes, and I think another key to this understanding of how we can really uh, change things in the world is to understand what is the purpose of this life. Mm. And I had a beautiful elder share with me. He says, you know, when we are born in our mother's womb, we are this microscopic, tiny, tiny beginning. And within the, within the time we're in our mother's womb, we grow our arms and legs and eyes and ears and lungs, and we don't need them there. But yet we're in this world, yet the child can't understand that. And then we're born to this world. And when we're born to this world, we leave behind our womb suit. And we get a new earth suit. And all of a sudden, all that what was developed in the womb suit becomes understood for this world. Our lungs can now breathe air. So the purpose of this elder said to me, was the purpose of this life is to grow our spiritual arms and legs and eyes and ears in preparation for the worlds of light yet to come. Our spiritual eyes, our spiritual understanding, our souls to become more kind, more loving, more compassionate, more forgiving, more just. Yes. Mm. And by gaining that, when we leave our earth suits beyond, behind and go on beyond... <laughs> <laughs> no. Leave the earth suits beyond. Leave the earth suits behind and go beyond. The motive power in those other worlds of light are all the spiritual qualities we've developed, and they can only be developed through being challenged and through tests and difficulties. And so, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. That's so profound. And as much as I want to keep talking, we have yeah. to wrap this show up. Miracle Makers, we're so glad that you're here. There are links on our website. Greg, go ahead. No, I, that, that's it right there with Miracle Makers, is that even though it's nice to be a Miracle Maker, it is through those tests and challenges that we fully blossom yes. and receive the full miracles of our lives. So yep. it's so critical to embrace that and to step into that courageously. It's so yeah. important to step in to and allow ourselves to see every stressor as a stretcher yeah. um, that stretches us for the soul's purpose. Thank you mm. so much. Thank you. Chief, Thank, you. Chief, Thank you so much. <laughs> Chief Lane um, Jr., just so grateful. So grateful for your book, The Sacred Tree, and so grateful that we got to share this time with you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. It's an honor to me. Awesome. Is, will you close out with just a word or two in native? Y yes. Bye, Anki. Why Anki? Why Anki? Why Anki? Chanupa Kile. Why why onki e o ho shunk mano he meo do chinupa sapa he meo do ho let me chante wash day ho thank you so much